Hello, everyone. In this lecture, we are going to study about the basics of spleen. As we all know, spleen is a secondary lymphoid organ. So, primary lymphoid organs include the bone marrow and thymus, where the lymphocytes they originate and they become mature. And after getting matured in the primary lymphoid organs, they will go and populate the secondary lymphoid organs, which include the lymph nodes, spleen, mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, and tonsils. And we have to remember that spleen is the largest lymphoid organ. So the first point we have to remember about spleen is this is the largest largest lymphoid organ. Okay. So spleen is the largest lymphoid organ. This is a secondary lymphoid organ. It is intraperitoneal. It is intra peritoneal and it is present in the left upper quadrant just below the left diaphragm. Okay, so it is present in the left upper quadrant just below the left diaphragm. As you can see here, this is the spleen. You can appreciate it also has a connective tissue capsule similar to what we have discussed in lymph nodes. Okay, so spleen will also have a connective tissue capsule and this connective tissue capsule will throw projections into the splenic parenchyma and these are known as the trabeculae. Okay, so these are similar to what we discussed for lymph nodes. However, there are very important distinctions, differences between the lymph node structure and the spleen structure. In spleen, you will not find afferent lymphatics. Okay, we have discussed in lymph nodes that lymph nodes will have afferent lymphatics which are present on the convex surface of the lymph node. But in case of spleen, you can also appreciate that it also has a convex surface but it will not have afferent lymphatics. So spleen doesn't have afferent lymphatics. However, it will have efferent lymphatics. As you can see here, this is the efferent lymphatic. Okay, so this is the hilum. You can appreciate that it, ha it has efferent lymphatics. In the hilum, you will also find the splenic artery. So this is the splenic artery. And you can also find the splenic vein. So this is the splenic vein. Okay. So this is the splenic vein, this is the splenic artery, and we are also finding the efferent lymphatics in the hilum. Okay, so that is the first difference from the lymph node. The six, second difference is no clear cut cortex and medulla. Cortex bar medulla. So cortical and medullary differentiations are not there inside the spleen. In lymph nodes, we have discussed that lymph node has cortex and medulla and we will also discuss about the thymus. Thymus also have cortex and medulla but spleen doesn't have cortex and medulla. Okay, so these are the two important differences between the lymph nodes and the spleen. Okay, and if you see uh, again we will see the hilum. In hilum you can find the splenic artery which is going into the splenic parenchyma. You can also appreciate the splenic vein which is coming out of the splenic parenchyma and you, you can also see the efferent lymphatics which is coming out of the spleen. The splenic artery, it's a branch of celiac trunk. Okay, so you can see this is the outer. This is the outer. And there is a branch of outer which is which is known as the celiac trunk. Okay, so this is the celiac trunk. Okay, so this is the celiac trunk. And from the celiac trunk, the splenic artery will originate. Okay, so from the celiac trunk, the splenic artery will originate. <clears throat> then if you see the splenic vein, the splenic vein, after it comes out of the spleen, it will merge with inferior mesenteric vein. So this is the inferior mesenteric vein. Okay. After that, the splenic vein will merge with the superior mesenteric vein. Okay. It will join with the superior mesenteric vein. Superior mesenteric vein. So splenic vein, after joining with the superior mesenteric vein, it will make the portal vein. Okay, so it will form the portal vein and this portal vein will go, go into the liver. So this is the liver. This portal vein will go into the liver. Okay, after that, uh, with the help of hepatic veins, it will, it will drain into the inferior vena cava. That will ultimately go to the right side of the heart. Okay, so this is the arterial supply and the splenic, uh, arterial supply and the venous drainage of the spleen. Okay. And little bit more about the anatomy of the lymph, uh, sorry, spleen, we have to understand. For that, we have to remember a very important 
dictum that is known as Harris dictum of odd numbers. Okay, so if you remember these odd numbers, that is enough to understand the anatomy of the, I mean the dimensional anatomy of the spleen. So what is this Harris dictum of odd number? The first thing, first is one inch thick. So spleen is one inch thick. So thickness of the spleen is one inch. Next one is three inch is the breadth or you can say the width of the spleen. So width of the spleen is three inch. Length, length of the spleen is five inch. Then weight of the spleen, weight of the spleen is seven ounce. Seven ounce means it is around uh, 200 grams, 200 grams. However, uh, this is just to simplify the things. Usually uh, 200 grams, though it is normal, but it is in the higher range. Usually it is around 150 grams. Okay, spleen is around 150 grams. 200 grams is slightly on the higher side. Okay. And the next thing is spleen is present below 9th to 11th rib. Okay. So it is present on the left side. It is present below the 9th to 11th ribs. Okay. So these are the odd numbers that you have to remember with respect to spleen. And this is known as the Harris spectrum of odd numbers. Okay. So this is some, uh, these are some points about the anatomy of the spleen. And we have also discussed two very important points of difference between the splenic structure and the lymph node structure. That uh, spleen doesn't have afferent lymphatics and there is no clear cut cortex and medulla in the spleen. Now we'll see and I will go into the more structural details or you can say the histology of the spleen. So basically spleen is made up of white pulp. It is made up of white pulp and red pulp. White pulp and red pulp. White pulp is basically, it consists of the lymphocytes. It contains the lymphocytes. And as you all know, lymphocytes, they take part in the immunological function of the spleen. And the red pulp, usually it contains the RBCs. That is why these are, uh, that is why it is known as the red pulp. Okay, so this presence of RBCs will give the reddish appearance. And the lymphocyte rich region is known as white pulp. Though these are not actually white, these are actually bluish in nature because the lymphocytes will give uh, blue blue color. But uh, because these are not red, these are these are called white pulp. Okay, so spleen is basically made up of white pulp and red pulp. Okay, if you see the splenic cut section, you will find multiple white pulps and uh, diffusely present red pulp. But for the sake of simplification, I have just drawn a schematic diagram to understand how these white pulp and red pulps are organized. Okay. But definitely, uh, 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 spleen will have multiple white pulps and diffusely present red pulp. In this diagram, I am just showing one white pulp and a small area of the red pulp. Okay. There is one more thing between white pulp and red pulp that is known as the marginal zone. Okay. So if you see in this, uh, uh, I mean, in this diagram, you can find this upper area, this upper area, this part, or you can say the this part. This part is actually made up of, you can see these are the lymph, uh, lymphocytes. So this is the white pulp. This area, which is full of RBCs, you can see this is the red pulp. And in between this white pulp and red pulp, we can appreciate that there is a yellowish area. Okay. And that is known as the marginal zone. That is known as the marginal zone. Okay. So to understand each of these things, we'll try to figure out each and every aspect of the Spleen. We can start from the splenic artery and we'll uh, travel through this splenic artery and we'll try to understand what is there inside the spleen. So if you see, this is the splenic artery. As you all know, this is the splenic artery. So splenic artery, after entering the spleen through the phylum, it will make the trabecular artery. Trabecular artery. So this is the trabecular artery, which is present along with the trabeculae. So this is the trabecular artery. The trabecular artery will form central artery. Okay. So after coming out of the trabeculae, it will make the central artery. So you can see after the trabecular artery, the artery that you can see here, this is known as the central artery. Why it is known as central artery? Because you can appreciate that surrounding this artery, you can find a lymphoid seed. Okay. So these are all 
lymphocytes as you can see here these are all lymphocytes okay and surrounding this central artery you can find a lymphoid seal that is known as peri arteriolar lymphoid seal okay so this lymphoid seal which is present which is encircling the central artery that is known as peri arteriolar lymphoid seal okay and you have to remember that this peri arteriolar lymphoid seal is made up of this is made up of the t lymphocytes this is made up of t lymphocytes if you remember the structure of the lymph nodes we have discussed that uh, the t lymphocytes are present in the paracortex of the lymph node okay and inside the spleen the t lymphocytes are present in the peri arteriolar lymphoid seal okay so if you take cross section at this level you can find the central artery you can find you can find the artery in the center and surrounding that we can find the lymphoid seal okay so these are the t lymphocytes these are the t lymphocyte and this is the central artery this is the central artery okay but sometimes near this central artery you can find lymphoid follicle so this is one lymphoid follicle okay lymphoid follicle and we all know that lymphoid follicles are made up of these are made up of b lymphocytes these are made up of b lymphocytes okay so this entire structure is known as white pulp white pulp contains the central artery with peri arteriolar lymphoid seed and sometimes you can also find the lymphoid follicles okay and these lymphoid follicles are made up of b lymphocytes peri arteriolar lymphoid seed is made up of t lymphocytes okay and if you see if you take cross section at the level of lymphoid follicles okay so if you take cross section at the level of lymphoid follicles you can find this is the you can find lymphoid follicle like this and you will find the central artery like this okay so this is known as the eccentric arrangement of central artery if you take cross section at the level of lymphoid follicles if you take the cross section at the level of peri arterial arteriolar lymphoid seed, you will find central artery in central location in central position but if you take cross section at the lymphoid follicle you will find central artery in the in the eccentric position okay one more uh, one more point you have to understand that even when even uh, even if you find the lymphoid follicles at this area also this central artery will be surrounded by some of the t lymphocytes so t lymphocytes will also be there here okay so basically the central artery is usually encircled by the t lymphocytes and in some areas along with the t lymphocytes you will find the lymphoid follicles okay and we have discussed when you discussed about the lymph nodes whenever these lymphoid follicles are activated whenever these are activated you can find the germinal center okay the central part will be uh, composed of activated b lymphocytes that will give a pale appearance in the center that is known as the germinal center and that will be surrounded by a darker zone that is known as the mantle zone that is known as the mantle zone okay this we have already discussed when we discussed about the lymph nodes but you have to remember in the spleen in the spleen whenever this lymphoid follicles are activated along with this germinal center and mantle zone you can also appreciate the marginal zone you can also appreciate the marginal zone okay because this marginal zone is present in the in the spleen okay so this is about the white pulp but you have to remember that along with this lymphocytes there will also be macrophages there will also be macrophages and also there will be and also there will be dendritic cells okay there will be dendritic cells okay whenever you find the t lymphocytes near the t lymphocyte uh, t lymphocyte dendritic cells has to be present because these dendritic cells will present antigens to these t lymphocytes okay so in the white pulp you will find the lymphocytes t lymphocytes in the peri arteriolar lymphoid cell b lymphocytes in the lymphoid follicles along with that you will also find the macrophages and the dendritic cells okay so this is about the structure of white pulp now we'll see what is going to happen with the central artery now this central artery it will be divided to penicillary arteries okay so if you see here this one 
this one here is it is known as the penny ciliary artery penny ciliary artery this penny ciliary artery will terminate with penny ciliary arterioles okay so these are the arterioles you can see here okay so splenic artery then trabecular artery then the central artery then the penny ciliary artery and it will terminate in the penny ciliary arterioles okay and you can see here sometimes this arterioles will directly open into the splenic sinusoids okay it will directly open into the splenic sinusoids and sometimes this arterioles will open blindly into the splenic parenchyma into the splenic cords of vitro okay so now we are coming to the red pulp area so basically this penicillary arterioles will end up in the red pulp area okay so you can see here in the red pulp you can find this multiple venous channels okay so as you can see here these are the multiple open ending splenic sinusoids these are known as the splenic sinusoids so sinusoids are basically specialized you can say these are specialized capillaries specialized capillaries which have multiple uh, openings because they will have discontinuous basement membrane this we have discussed when we discuss about the uh, uh, bone marrow structure also okay so basically sinusoids are specialized capillaries which which will have a discontinuous basement membrane so you can find gaps between the endothelial linings so as you can appreciate here these sinusoids they have gaps in the endothelial linings okay so these are known as the splenic sinusoids okay and these are open ending okay these are open ending in the red pulp area of the spleen okay sometimes the penicillary arterioles can directly come and drain uh, it can join in the join into the splenic sinusoids as you can see here so in this area you can see the penicillary artery is opening directly into the splenic sinusoid surrounding this splenic sinusoid the structure the area that is there in the red pulp that is known as the splenic cords or cords of vitroth okay so this area this area which is present surrounding the splenic sinusoids that is known as splenic cords of vitroth splenic cords of Vitroth. Okay. We have discussed in the lymph node also. In the lymph node also, we have discussed that in the medulla, you can find the medullary sinusoids or medullary sinuses, and surrounding that medullary sinusoid, we will find the medullary cords. Similarly, in the spleen, in the red pulp area, you will find the splenic sinuses or sinusoids, and surrounding the splenic sinusoids, you will find the splenic cords of Vitroth. And these penicillary arterioles, they can either directly open to the splenic sinusoids or they do open. Uh, or they open into the splenic cords. Okay, these are known as the splenic cords of Vitroth. If they open directly into the splenic sinusoids, that is known as closed circulation. Okay, that is known as closed circulation. But the, if they open blindly into the splenic cords of Vitroth, that is known as the open circulation. Okay, so if you see the flow of an RBC in this splenic artery, so this splenic uh, the RBC will come out of the splenic. Uh, I mean the penciliary arterioles. If it is going through the closed circulation, it can directly go into the splenic sinusoids. From the splenic sinusoids, it will go into the pulp veins. Okay, so these are the pulp veins. These are the pulp veins. Then they will make the trabecular vein. Trabecular vein. And ultimately, they will make the splenic vein, which will come out of the spleen. Okay. So if the RBC from the pen, uh, penicillary arterioles, it is going directly into the splenic sinusoids, which is known as the closed circulation, those RBCs can go into the pulp veins, then the trabecular veins, and through the splenic veins, they can come out of the spleen. However, if the RBCs follow the open circulation, open circulation means from the penicillary arterioles, they will go into the, into the cords of Bidroth, they are following the open circulation. If they are following the open circulation, these RBCs from the cords, they have to come into the splenic sinusoids in order to come out of the spleen. Okay. So this is what we have discussed when you discuss about the basics of RBCs. So RBCs are highly deformable. These are highly deformable because uh, they have extra membrane. They have extra membrane and they have a very good cytoskeletal structural proteins. They have very good cytoskeletal structure. And because of those properties, these RBCs are highly deformable 
because they are highly deformable, they can negotiate these small openings in the sinusoids. They can negotiate through these sinusoidal openings and they can go from the pores of Billroth to the sinusoids. So as you can see here, these RBCs, these RBCs, they can go from the pores of Billroth into the sinusoids. Okay. And from these sinusoids, they will go into the pulp veins, then the trabecular veins, then the splenic veins. Okay. So there are two paths these RBCs can follow. Either they can go in the closed circulation or they can go into the open circulation. Okay. So whenever they go in the open circulation, if the RBCs are not deformable, if they are not deformable, they will get stuck in the in the splenic sinusoid. They will get stuck in the splenic sinusoid. They cannot negotiate the narrow openings. And if they are stuck in the splenic sinusoids, they will be engulfed by the splenic macrophages which are there in the cords of Billroth. So you can see these are the splenic macrophages. And these splenic macrophages which are there in the cords of Billroth, they will have uh, projection, they will have pseudopod extension into the splenic sinusoids. Okay, so because of their these extensions, if the RBCs are get trapped in the splenic sinusoids, they can engulf those RBCs, they can destroy those RBCs. These, these concepts we have discussed when we discussed about the fate of senescent RBCs, and also we have discussed when uh, in cases of extravascular hemolysis. Okay, so we have discussed whenever the RBCs are aged, whenever uh, they complete their lifespan of 120 days, so they will become less deformable and they will get trapped in the splenic sinusoids and they will be engulfed phagocytos and destroyed by the splenic macrophages. When you discuss about the extravascular hemolysis and the classical example is heritage spherocytosis, in those conditions, RBCs, even though they are not 120 days old, because of some cytoskeletal protein abnormalities, they will become less deformable and they are high, I mean, uh, there is an increased risk of getting trapped in the splenic sinusoids and engulfed by the splenic macrophages. Okay, so this is the concept of closed circulation and open circulation. Okay, and because of this open circulation, you will find plenty of RBCs in the splenic cords of Billroth and that will give the red appearance, red disappearance, and that is why it is known as the red pulp. Okay, so it is clear now. So red pulp is made up of splenic sinus, uh, sinusoids and the splenic cords of Billroth. And in the cords, we will find the RBCs. But along with the RBCs, we will find also we will find the macrophages and also we will find the plasma cells, which I have not shown here. We will also find the plasma cells and also various supporting cells also, okay, reticular cells also. Okay, so this is the basic structure. But apart from this, as I have told you, between the white pulp and red pulp, you can appreciate that there is a yellowish area and that is known as the marginal zone. That is known as the marginal zone. This marginal zone, will contain plenty of macrophages. Okay, so it will contain plenty of macrophages and also dendritic cells. Okay, we'll discuss more on plasma, I mean more on marginal zone in the next slide. Okay, so this is about the structure in a not cell. Okay, I'll just revise it again. You can start with the splenic artery. If you start with the splenic artery, so this is the splenic artery. This is the splenic artery. Then it will form the trabecular artery. Then it will form the central artery. Surrounding the central artery, you will find the periarterial lymphoid cell. Okay. Anyway, uh, first we'll uh, complete the arterial. Uh, I mean, uh, we'll complete the vascular uh, circulation. So splenic artery, trabecular artery, central artery. Then they will make the penicillary artery. This penicillary artery will end up with penicillary artery roots. Either they can go in the closed circulation where they open directly into the splenic sinusoids. Okay, so they can directly open into the splenic sinusoids. Or if they follow the open circulation, they will open blindly in the splenic cords of Billroth. Splenic cords of Billroth. Okay, if they follow the closed circulation, the RBCs from the arterioles will go into the splenic sinusoids, then into the pulp veins, then into the trabecular veins, and ultimately they will come out to the splenic vein. If they follow the open circulation, they will go into the cords of Billroth. From the cords of Billroth, they will negotiate through the opening in the splenic sinusoids. And from the splenic sinusoids, again, they can go into the pulp veins, trabecular veins, and the splenic vein. Okay, this is the vascular arrangement. Okay, inside this, we have the... Inside this, we have uh, the white pulp, which is made up of lymphocytes. So basically, T lymphocytes are present in the pulse, periarterial lymphoid cell. B lymphocytes are present in the lymphoid follicles. Along with the lymphocytes, you will find macrophages and the dendritic cells in the white pulp. In the red pulp, we have sinusoids and the we have sinusoids and the cords of Billroth. 
in the cords you will find the macrophages and the plasma cells also the reticular cells also okay and we also have the marginal zone which is present between the red pulp and white pulp and this marginal zone will be uh, filled with uh, the macrophages the stromal cells reticular cells dendritic cells okay so this marginal zone has a very important function in the screen that we will discuss in the next slide okay so this is the arrangement and uh, we'll see each part one by one and we'll see what is their functions So first, uh, first we'll start with the white pulp. So nothing uh, uh, much to say. We have already discussed that white pulp is made up of uh, the pulse, which is the periarterial lymphoid seed made up of the T lymphocytes. Then we have the lymphoid follicles made up of B lymphocytes. So basically, I have told you if the lymphoid follicles are activated, if they are activated, you can find the germinal center. In the center, you will find the germinal center. Surrounding that, you will find the mantle zone. And surrounding the mantle zone, you will find the marginal zone. Okay. So when we discuss about the lymph nodes, we did not discuss about anything about the marginal zone, but marginal zones are present in the spleen. So whenever there is lymphoid follicle, activated lymphoid follicle formation, or you can say the secondary uh, lymphoid follicles, uh, they, will, uh, they will have uh, the outer zone that is known as the marginal zone. Okay, then we'll discuss a little bit about the marginal zone. Okay. Before that, I have told you, uh, if you take cross-section at the level of a T lymphocyte rich area, you will find the central artery in the central location. But if you take a cross-section at the level of follicular area, okay, lymphoid follicle area, we will find the central artery in an eccentric position. Okay, so this is very easy to understand. Also, in the white pulp, you will uh, find the macrophages. So macrophages, I am showing with this, uh, I mean, uh, this sign. And so you will find the macrophages and also you will find the dendritic cells. We will find the dendritic cells. Now we will see about the marginal zone. So marginal zone, it is present between the white pulp and red pulp, as you can see here. Actually, the capillary loops, I mean, whenever these penicillary arteries, they will end up with arterioles. They will make the capillary loops. These capillary loops are usually present in the marginal zone. Okay, so basically uh, at the junction of marginal zone and the red pulp, these capillary loops will be present. Okay. And because capillary loops are present in the marginal zone, marginal zone is the area where uh, the uh, circulation, I mean the systemic circulation, the systemic circulation interact with splenic parenchyma. As you all know, in any tissue, any, any tissue, Whatever interaction happens between the circulation and the tissue, it happens at the capillary level. And because these capillary loops are present in the marginal zone in the spleen, the interaction between the spleen, uh, systemic circulation and the spleening parenchyma happens in the marginal zone. Okay. So basically, uh, the lymphocytes, the B and T lymphocytes, the B and T lymphocytes, from the circulation, from the circulation, they will come into the spleening parenchyma at this marginal zone level. Okay, so basically the B and T lymphocytes will come from the circulation into the splenic parenchyma at this level, at this, uh, at this level of marginal zone. And from here, they will go into the particular area designated for T and B lymphocytes, depending on the chemokine that is present in that particular area. Okay, this is the same concept that we have discussed for lymph nodes also. And in the lymph nodes, I have told you, the lymphocytes, the B and T lymphocytes, they will go into the lympho lymph node parenchyma at the paracortex okay so at the level of paracortex through the high endothelial venules they will enter the lymph nodes and from there the b lymphocyte uh, lymphocytes will go into the germinal center uh, sorry the b lymphocytes will go into the lymphoid follicles which are present in the cortex t lymphocytes will populate the paracortex depending on the chemokine that the particular area is producing similarly for spleen the b and t lymphocytes will enter the splenic parenchyma at the level of marginal zone from there it will go and populate the designated areas okay so basically, they will also produce some chemokines. They will also produce chemokines. These are produced by the stromal cells. These are produced by the stromal cells that are present in the that are present in the uh, uh, marginal zone. And these chemokines they will attract the B and T lymphocytes. Okay. Apart from this, uh, this marginal zone will have plenty of macrophages. They will have plenty of macrophages. And these macrophages help in interaction with the 
I mean, uh, the, their major function at this level, I mean, in the marginal zone, the macrophages that are present, their major function is antigen presentation. Okay. So as I have told you, macrophage, they can cause phagocytosis and destruction of the cells, affected cells, but they can also play a role uh, of antigen presenting cell. These are also antigen presenting cells like the dendritic cells. At this level, in the marginal zone, the macrophages that are present, their main function is to uh, their main function is to present antigens to the T lymphocytes. Okay, so their main function is to present antigens to the T lymphocytes. Okay, so these are the important functions of marginal zone. Okay, so they will have macrophages which act as antigen presenting cells. They will have stromal cells which will, pro which will produce the chemokines that will attract the B and T lymphocytes. And this B and T, T lymphocytes from the circulation will come into the splenic parenchyma at this marginal zone and from there they will go into the designated areas. Okay, so this is about the marginal zone. We have also discussed about the white pulp. Now we'll discuss a little bit about the red pulp. So red pulp, as I have told you, this is, this is it is made up of sinusoids and the cords. Basically, in the cords, you will find the RBCs that will give the reddish appearance. You will also find you will also find macrophages, as I have told you. You will also find macrophages, and these macrophages will have extension cytoplasmic extensions into the splenic sinusoids so that they can engulf the trapped RBCs. You can also find plasma cells. As you can see here, these are the these are the plasma cells. So basically, after the B lymphocytes are activated in the white pulp, these B lymphocytes will uh, produce the plasma cells, which are the antibody producing cells. And these uh, plasma cells from the white pulp region, they can come into the splenic cords of Billroth. And here they can produce antibodies which will go through the splenic sinusoids out of the spleen into the systemic circulation. Okay, again, this concept is same what we have discussed for the lymph nodes. In the lymph nodes, the activated B lymphocytes are there in the cortex, in the lymphoid follicles, and there the plasma cells will be produced. Those plasma cells will come to the medullary cords in case of spleen, uh, uh, lymph nodes. In the spleen, these plasma cells will come into the cords of Billroth. Here they will produce the antibodies which through the splenic sinusoids will. Uh, go out of the, I mean, through the splenic sinusoids, you go into the splenic vein and ultimately out of the spleen into the systemic circulation. Okay, so they will also have the plasma cells, or also they will have supporting structures like reticular cells. Basically, these reticular cells will give a reticular mesure kind of appearance. That is why it is known as the splenic cords. Okay, so cords of spleen Okay, and in the red pulp, we will find the closed, closed circulation. In closed circulation, the arterioles will open directly into the splenic sinusoids. Directly into the splenic sinusoids. From the splenic sinusoids, it will go into the pulp vein, then the trabecular vein, then the splenic, then the splenic vein. In the open circulation, the arterioles they will open into the cords, cords of Billroth blindly. From the cords, the RBCs, they will negotiate through the openings in the splenic sinusoids into the sinusoids. And from sinusoids, they can go into the pulp vein, then the radical vein and the splenic vein. So this is about the, this is the concept of closed and open circulation. Okay, so now we have understood the structure of spleen completely. If you see uh, the histology, as I have told you, uh, for the uh, purpose of, uh, I mean, for the sake of simplification, I have just shown one white pulp one red pulp, but as you can see here, this entire area, these are all red pulp. You can see these are all red pulp area. And in between this red pulp area, you can find some pale areas, which are not exactly white, but you can say these are slightly pale areas. And these are known as the white pulp. Okay, so this is the white pulp area. Okay, you can appreciate uh, this is a lymphoid follicle. This is a lymphoid follicle. You can see the central arteriole is present in the eccentric location. Okay, so because uh, it is a section where you can find the lymphoid follicle, if you see the section of lymphoid follicle, the central arteriole will be present in the in a eccentric location. But if you see the longitudinal cross section of a central artery, so this is the central artery longitudinal cross section, and you can find that surrounding this central artery, you can find these. This is the periarteriolar, periarteriolar lymphoid sheet, and this is the lymphoid follicle. Okay, and this is the central artery. 
Okay. And if you see one lymphoid follicle, you can find in, in the center, you can find the germinal center. So basically in the center, you can find the germinal center. Surrounding germinal center, there is a darker area that is known as the mantle zone. And surrounding that, this area, which is slightly pale, that is marginal zone. Okay, it is marginal zone. Germinal center is pale because it contains the activated lymphocytes, activated B lymphocytes, which will have open chromatin. So that is why it is pale. Marginal zone is dark because it, it has inactive, inactive B lymphocytes, inactive B lymphocytes, which will have a compact chromatin that will give a dark appearance. Again, marginal zone is slightly pale. That is because it has it contains a lot of macrophages. So macrophages will also have pale appearance. Okay. And if you see a higher magnification image, you can also appreciate that this is again a lymphoid follicle. This is a lymphoid follicle. This is the central arteriole, which is present eccentrically. You can find in the center uh, of a lymphoid follicle, you can find this is the germinal center. This area is the mantle zone and surrounding this area, this part is the marginal zone. Here you can see this is the central artery. This is the central artery, sorry, central artery, which is, uh, I mean, uh, this is the longitudinal section and surrounding central artery, this part, this area, all this area, this is the periarteriolar lymphoid sheath and this is the lymphoid nodule or the lymphoid follicle. Okay. So this is how, uh, this is how you can identify the spleen. Okay. So as we have discussed uh, the basics, uh, I mean the structure, now we'll see what are the functions of the spleen. So this basically there are four important functions of spleen. The first one is, the first one is phagocytosis of RBCs and particulate matter. This phagocytosis of RBCs, this I have already told you, this I have already discussed. So basically they can phagocytose either the senescent RBCs, either senescent RBCs, or if they are deformed, if they are deformed, or if they are opsonized, if they are opsonized. Okay. So this concept we have discussed when you discussed about the extravascular hemolysis. Okay. So I'm not going to discuss these things again. Okay. We have discussed whenever the RBCs are senescent, I mean, they are 120 days old, they can be trapped or whenever they are deformed, they can be tra trapped. And if they are opsonized, they can be identified by the macrophages and they can be destroyed. Okay. And what is this? Uh, I mean, phagocytosis of particulate matter. This I have discussed when I discussed about the, <coughs> sorry. This I discussed when I discussed about the concept of Heinz body. And Howell Jolie body. So basically Heinz body, this we classically find in patients with G6PD deficiency. In G6PD deficiency, because of the deficiency of this enzyme, there will be increased reactive oxygen species production and those oxidative damage will cause denaturation of the globin change in the RBCs. And those denatured globin change will form this Heinz body. They will make this Heinz body. This Heinz bodies, I mean, these RBCs which contain Heinz bodies, when they pass through the splenic circulation, this area of uh, this area of RBC, which is containing Heinz body, that will be taken by the that will be pinched off by the macrophages. Okay, actually, this process is known as pitting. This process of pinching of a portion of RBCs by the macrophages by the splenic macrophages, this process is known as pitting. So basically, pitting is caused by the splenic macrophages when the RBCs contain either the Heinz bodies or the second concept is about the Havel jolly bodies. I have told you Havel jolly bodies basically when the reticulocytes they come to the circulation, they will have some chromatins. They will have some chromatins, and these chromatins are usually taken up by the splenic macrophages, and ultimately they form the mature RBCs, which will not contain any DNA material or any chromatin. But if the spleen is not functioning, these chromatins can condense, and they can make this small inclusion-like thing that is known as Havel jolly body. Okay, so because of I mean, because of uh, defective removal of the particulate matter, you can find these science bodies and you can also find, uh, sorry, you can find Havel jolly bodies and you can also find plenty of Heinz bodies in patients with G6PD deficiency if they have decreased splenic function. Okay. 
so basically hinge bodies and uh, hyoid jelly bodies they appear identical however hinge bod hinge bodies are uh, found if you do supra vital strain if you do supra vital strain you can find the hinge bodies but hyoid jelly bodies can be identified on routine strain the routine jimsa strain you can find the hyoid jelly bodies these things i have already discussed in my previous videos so i am not going into the details now okay the second function is the second function is antibody production so basically the antigens will be taken up by the dendritic cells these dendritic cells will interact with the t cells this we have already discussed in the uh, when i discussed about the uh, hlh i have uh, told you how the t lymphocytes are activated with the help of dendritic cells so basically dendritic cells these are the i mean these are the prototype uh, professional antigen presenting cells they will take up the antigens they will present to the t cells these t cells when they are activated they can also activate the b lymphocytes with various interactions this will discuss more when we will discuss about the immunology and this again this b lymphocytes they will convert to the plasma cells and these plasma cells will go to the splenic cord supply lobe where they will release the antibodies they will release the antibodies this antibody from the, through the splenic sinusoids they can come into the systemic circulation this function is very important for polysaccharide antigens it is very important for uh, for the polysaccharide antigens which are present in the capsulated organisms so basically the bacterial capsule is made up of polysaccharides these are made up of polysaccharides with some exceptions of course but most of the most of the uh, bacteria have polysaccharide i mean uh, those uh, I mean, most of the capsulated bacteria will have polysaccharide capsule okay and this spleen has very important function in producing antibodies in producing immune response against this polysaccharide antigens which are present in the capsulated organisms okay so that is why whenever there is decreased splenic function there is increased risk of infection with capsulated organisms okay so this is a very important function of spleen that they form they make antibodies they make antibodies against the capsular polysaccharide antigens the third function is the third function is hematopoiesis this again i have discussed when i told uh, when i discussed about the basics of hematopoiesis the normal hematopoiesis i have told you in the second trimester along with liver in the second trimester along with liver spleen will also have some amount of hematopoiesis okay in the second trimester along with the liver of course liver is the primary organ where the hematopoiesis happens in the second trimester but along with liver spleen will also have some amount of ability and in patients with extra medullary hematopoiesis this we have discussed in detail in the disorders of rbcs so whenever there is extra medullary hematopoiesis extra medullary hematopoiesis can happen in the spleen so in the, these patients we can find hepatosplenomegaly okay and classically this extra medullary hematopoiesis is found in hemolytic anemias especially the inherited hemolytic anemias and also in patients with myeloproliferative neoplasms okay so this uh, this i'll discuss uh, later so in these two conditions i mean uh, this condition in these conditions we'll find the extra medullary hematopoiesis where there will be massive splenomegaly because of this increased hematopoiesis in the spleen the fourth uh, fourth function is sequestration of the blood cells so basically spleen it will contain around 30 to 40% of the blood volume 30 to 40 percent of the blood volume, around 30 to 40 percent of the platelets. Okay, 30 to 40 percent of the platelet inside the body is there inside the spleen. Okay, and whenever there is splenomegaly, whenever there is splenomegaly, it can accommodate up to it can accommodate up to 80 to 90 percent of the body's platelet. It can accommodate up to 80 to 90 percent of the body's platelet. Okay. So in normal circumstances, around one third of the platelet is sequestered inside the spleen. But whenever there is increased size of the spleen, it can accommodate around 80 to 90 percent of the platelets. And we have discussed whenever there is hypersplenism. Hypersplenism means splenomegaly along with increased activity of the spleen. I mean, there is increased sequestration by the spleen. It can cause pancytopenia because it can sequester all the blood cells into it. So it can result in pancytopenia. Okay, so these are the four important functions. The first one is phagocytosis of RBCs and phagocytosis of particulate matter, which is otherwise known as PT. Second one is antibody production, predominantly against the capsular polysaccharide antigens. Third one is hematopoiesis, 
especially in the second trimester of uh, pregnancy and uh, and uh, during the extra medullary hematopoiesis and the fourth one is secretion of the blood cells around 30 30 to 40 percent of the platelet is there inside the spleen and uh, whenever there is hypersplenogen they can sequester all the blood cells they can cause pancytopenia what are the consequences of splenic function the first one the classical one this we have already discussed previously this is uh, known as the classical avail jolly bodies avail jolly bodies okay as you can see here these are the inclusions these are the chromatin materials which are condensed or you can say the dna materials which are condensed because the spleen is not able to remove them from the reticulocytes so the mature rbc will also contain this inclusions of chromatin material this is known as the havel jewelry body this is the routine strain the similar type of image if they will give with supravital strain the answer will be heinz body okay so if the patient has decreased splenic function now decreased splenic function can be due to i mean it can be due to autosplenectomy in patients with sickle cell disease it can be due to uh, i mean uh, congenital asplenia or it can be due to uh, splenectomy, post splenectomy. So there are various, uh, I mean, causes of decreased splenic function. So in those patients, if you do the peripheral smear, you are going to find these Havel gel bodies. And also, I, as I told you, there is increased risk of infection with capsulated organisms. With capsulated mm -hmm. organisms. Okay. So what are the important capsulated organisms that you have to remember? Those are pneumococcus. Pneumococcus, meningococcus. I mean, pneumococcus is the streptococcus pneumonia, meningococcus is the nasaria meningitis, and H influenza, pneumophilus influenza. So, these are the three important capsulated organisms that you have to remember. So, all those patients, who are, I mean, all those patients who have decreased pain function, they have to be vaccinated with these, vaccinated, vaccinated for these organisms. Okay, so this is about the basics of spleen. In the next section, we will discuss various pathologies involving the spleen.